please welcome Steve Rotherham. I thought a shadow home secretary I said. <laughs> Former shadow home secretary, now mayor of Greater Manchester, born in Old Rome. What about the Old Rome Club? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not anything else in Old Rome, it's not anywhere near. Would you please welcome Andy Burnham? questions, rehearse them now and uh, after the guys have had a quick chat with you and themselves, uh, we'll, I'll come round to you with a microphone, so uh, rehearse your questions if you would. Just a tip, never stand with your hands on your head. You end up in radio, <laughs> I found. Okay, Andy, Steve, the stage is all yours, sir. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, He's typically uh, said you start and that's because uh, he then gets the opportunity to fill in all the blanks and to look intelligent because I forgot to say certain things. But um, the only thing I'm going to say is we're in the peace centre, right? Remember that. No jibes <laughs> in my direction. <laughs> uh, the usual uh, gratuitous effect. Well, otherwise, it might, you know, it it might be the Warrington Guardian for the peace centre. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that we are. Um, I mean, the first thing is that. I was here um, 10 years ago, we were trying to remember exactly when it was and what it was for, um, but as the Lord Mayor of Liverpool at the time, because even though you know, it's, it's Warrington and it's not part of Liverpool or part of the Liverpool City region, although you had your chance, um, <laughs> it, it's, it is sort of equidistant, isn't it, between Liverpool and Manchester, so it's not far, it is uh, only down the road to us, and there is, uh, I think, a, a great connection between uh, the, the city of Liverpool and what happens in Warrington um, and um, I, th I think the work that the Peace Centre does is absolutely exceptional and we just saw it's 25 years uh, and 25 years since the death of Jonathan and Tim. Um, I think it's one of those things that everybody will remember, it's like the JFK thing isn't it, you'll always remember where you were. Uh, I was a, a young dad, believe it or not, at that time, uh, with a, a two-year-old child, and, and you just think that you know that could happen to anybody at that time. And uh, through adversity, um, this centre is a real tribute to what the the families have done, especially, of course, uh, the parents uh, of of um, well, of both children, um, and it's been used to great effect to affect people's lives uh, and 10 years ago I came here, it's the first time back, uh, I know it's a difficult, uh, I suppose with austerity, the economic conditions are slightly different than 10 years ago, shall I put it that way, when the, there were people who um, had money to put into to fundraise, so things like this are really helpful, so thanks for everybody for attending tonight and for uh, putting a few bob into those uh, envelopes, all of that will go to continue the great work that as it goes on at this centre uh, day after day. So thanks very much for your help and assistance. I'll just, I'll just echo that, because I think, you know, Steve said, I think we all remember, don't we? I actually grew up in the Warrington, uh, Warrington area, um, between Warrington and, and Lee, um, and remember it vividly, um, because obviously, um, Colin, Wendy, uh, Tim, Everton supporters, and Tim was out by Everton, uh, and Everton, <laughs> like Sue, um, Everton kit, as we would have done, it hit home very hard, you know, I remember it very, very vividly, and it's obviously difficult to remember, but we, we must, um, uh, because obviously in Tim's name uh, and Jonathan's, this centre has been built, and the thing I want us to say is, you know, the value of it, as Steve just said, was brought home, wasn't it, um, last year, when we saw the terrible atrocity at the Manchester Arena. Um, what I can say to you is, I, I have heard so much praise for this place and the foundation, uh, as it has supported people through that, that very difficult time, and what remains an incredibly uh, difficult time. As we perhaps move on, 
it doesn't for the families, of course. They're on that road forever. And the support uh, from you, uh, Wendy, Colin, all of your staff here has meant the world uh, to people. I know that. Uh, and on behalf of them, and indeed on behalf of all of the people of Greater Manchester, I just want to thank you uh, for what you've done, the, what the foundation has done uh, to support people and is continuing to do. It means, means everything. But as Steve said, the fact that you're all here tonight, you're also helping provide that support. And I can just say to you all, it's, it's hugely appreciated and, and massively needed. So thank you all very much indeed. <laughs> I suppose then we've touched on um, Liverpool and Manchester and Liverpool is now a city region and we've got part of Cheshire, we've got Halton um, and, and they truly feel part of the Liverpool city region. Um, but isn't it funny, when, when you go abroad, um, and I don't know how many people here uh, will do this. You're not this. making a bid for Warrington as well. I thought you were going to make a pitch for Warrington. Not yet. Not yet. You're going to get as well. No, they've, they've had the opportunity. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> when you go abroad, um, wear as well. people will say to you, where, you, where are you from? And I, I don't know whether people from Warrington say that, you know, I'm from Warrington, which is in between Liverpool and Manchester. But um, certainly people in Halton will say, uh, or certainly the Wirral, uh, they'll say we're from the Wirral, uh, which is by Liverpool. And Liverpool is a fantastic international brand. To, um, you know, if we had the opportunity to take a brand, for me, it'd be Liverpool. It's the fifth best recognised um, city brand in the world. And I think that's because we had something to do with football and also a music re uh, you know, revolution and four lads who shook the world and all that sort of stuff. But it, it's a great brand. And what we want to do is we want to use that brand to return to some of the halcyon days that we had. And we were second city of empire. Um, obviously, when Andy gets to do his bit, he'll tell us like all, all that the things that ever happened. Imagine, well, we didn't see you see all our yesterdays. He goes back to 1700 nod. At least I'm only going back to the 60s. So. Um, so Wait, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you, I'm telling uh, everybody a, a little bit about, about our brand, but it actually relates to uh, an experience that you and I had when we went to New York, didn't we, shortly after we were elected last year, at the invitation of the former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, and it was great, wasn't it, we met lots of uh, other, other mayors for the first time, and we were coming back through JFK Airport, and Virgin Atlantic staff had realised that we were both on the flight and they were very keen to sort of promote the fact that they were, you know, they had flights going from the northwest and they were kind of wanting to promote the north and they kind of said, oh, well, let's just come into this room and we're just going to just show you our new marketing materials. We don't want to let you go through without just showing you. It's oh, great. And we both sat down and they brought over this really glossy brochure. It looked fantastic. And on the front cover it said, this was the title of it, Manchester and the rest of Northern England. <laughs> We made that the kind of joint branding for uh, <laughs> the space was a picture. It was like uh... well, just because the people in Wirral say I know I'm from the Wirral by Liverpool, people often say I'm from Manchester, not far away from Liverpool. Just so <laughs> international audiences do understand it. And, and, and Andy is the Metro Mayor for, for Greater Manchester. And, and we didn't need that because we know we're created that Manchester. So we just called ourselves the Liverpool City Region. And, and it, both of us have been sort of down there, you know, in the, the, the Westminster bubble, as it's called. And, and people say, you know, it, it, it does the, is there a thing, you know, the Westminster bubble, does it exist? And it genuinely does. And I spent seven years down there. And, and honestly, God, some of the things that happened. Um, really, well, I'll tell you one of them. Uh, there was, there's, there's these parliamentary protocols that you have to try and learn, and there's a thing called Ace in May. Andy's probably even read it. I can't even spell it right. But Ace in May is, is the Bible of how the conventions uh, um, of the House are, are, are um, put into order. And on a, on a Tuesday, I was in sitting in my seat. And they, they go through the business of the next day, and somebody went to object, and he went, and the speaker goes, object, and then there, yeah, right, okay, moved on. And the chief whip of the, the, the Labour Party came over to me and said, Do you know what just happened there? I said, No, I've not got a clue. 
And he said, do you know your debate next Monday? I said, yeah. That objection means that they've just removed the time scale, so you might not have your debate now. And my debate was on Hillsborough, and it was to try and get release of all the documentation. And the guy, this is how mad that place is down here. The guy who objected to, to that is a fella, I was gonna say that, but that's why I used a different way. Um, but the fella uh, was a fella called Christopher Chu. And believe it or not, in the Queen's New Year's honours list, he's now Sir Christopher Chubb. And he's the guy who tried to stop the Hillsborough debate. And not only that, the thing that he wanted to replace it with, genuinely, you can check this, is he wanted a debate on MPs' pensions. <laughs> and, so <the> ne- <laughs> and so the next day... The next day, uh, you, you, you try and get... Um, uh, a PMQ, and it's really, really difficult to get a PMQ. And actually, we, I went to see the speaker, and the speaker said, Okay, I'll let you. And you bob up and down, and you probably see this all. You know, it's, it's like school, instead of putting your hand up, you bob up and down, you bob up and down. <laughs> and for half an hour, I bobbed up and down, and I thought, He's not going to bring me in. And he brought me in as the last question. And so I said, um, I said to uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, I said, um, Prime Minister, when are you going to get a grip of your back benches? Instead of debating, the deaths of 96 people and the release of documentation, one of your members has decided that MPs' pensions are more important. And we all decided to give credit where credit's due. <clears throat> and Cameron said, don't worry about it. I will ensure that the honourable member has his debate. And if you remember that debate, that's where me and Andy spoke about the importance of getting this documentation released. We got it released um, and then we all know the rest of that story, but that just shows you what happens. Uh, uh, so it's probably well done down there, isn't it? But we're, we're, I think we're both feeling that we're in the right, the right place at the right time. And I think the good thing, I don't know if you feel this, but I think the time has come for the northwest of England, indeed the north of England, to kind of come forward a bit and speak more with one voice and, and uh, you know, get our... Uh, Really, what, what we should have been given many years ago, which is investment to build the northern economy, and um, you know, we want to work with Warrington in that, don't we? Uh, you know, it's almost like we're the kind of bickering couple, and Warrington, the sensible teenager in the middle of uh, you know, these two. Uh, um, but that helps actually. Yeah, we need you in this uh, discussion. But we just feel this. You know, what we're doing. You know, we left that strange world behind, and I don't think we, either of us regret it. Uh, we feel that through devolution, we can begin to rebalance the country uh, and actually do more for ourselves, take more decisions here. As I say, build the, uh, the stature of the North, the voice of the North. Uh, and the more we do that with business, we think the stronger we will be. So I feel this very strong. I think Steve feels the same. For me, leaving Westminster, it's place first, party second. You know, we're here to promote our, our respective city regions first and foremost, but then the North West together. And I think the more that you kind of you know, work with us on that um, as Northwest businesses. I think, seriously, the momentum will more and more head, head our way. I feel it happening at the moment. I think there's a lot of negativity at a national level, you know, with Brexit and everything. Whichever side you're on, it's still a confused debate. And I think the Northwest has got a chance to break out of that and really get some positive momentum going. And we feel we're beginning to do that. But the more that Warrington, Cheshire, Lancashire join in, the stronger we will get together. And uh, as I say, I think this is a, a big moment where we can put the North well and truly on the map and uh, you know, hope you feel able to, uh, to, to to get on board with that. But um, should we take some questions, Steve? Is it better why don't we hear your thoughts rather than talk at you all that Can I just start with one question? Yeah. As somebody was born, don't shout, as somebody was born in Old Trafford and went to work at Radio City in Liverpool, you've done the reverse. Yeah. Did you get sick? <laughs> I'm sure the sulfur table's going to end a bit now. Um, uh, yes, it's an answer. Good to answer to that. But the way I always describe it, um, but, well, firstly, clearly, I represent the acceptable face of Merseyside football in Greater Manchester. So that's the first thing to say. Um, and the other thing I can also say is, you know, whenever asks me about it, I can just say, you know, well, I'm, I'm utterly impartial on football matters. I am equally in favour of City and United beating Liverpool on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> it's not complicated. And you're spot on about the world. My dad was from Birkenhead. I'm not from Liverpool. 
If you've got a question, put your hand up and I'll find you with a microphone. I'll be uh, the dimble bit. One at a time. <laughs> ah, here we go. Back up. Yeah, I found one. If the, um, so the is on these because of your staff, and at, uh, this morning they released the Northern Powerhouse Education Report confirming that, well, saying that the South was better education than the North. Why do you think that was, and what, do you, what are you boys going to do about it? I've got another question. Why was George Osborne the person on the radio talking about it? Uh, uh, never mind. Yeah, well, uh, do, you, do you want me to start and then? Yeah, because yeah, uh, Andy is also. Uh, Another one of his hats as the former Shadow Secretary of State for Education. So he'll tell you about uh, how policy is, is formulated. But for me, I, I did um, support this report and I supported it because the government keep on telling us that we need an evidence based approach. So don't go down and just ask for money. Uh, make certain that your business case stacks up. And this is a report. Um, from an independent and, and as you said, um, fairly decent and well respected um, source and it identifies something that we all know and that is that there's a north-south divide. So there's nothing new in it, there's no great epiphany um, and all of a sudden everyone's going to wake up and go, oh, I didn't realise that the, the south had been taking the PR out of for years. It's because of the place that I've been telling you about in London uh, and the mentality of people down there in that Westminster bubble. Everything's seen through the prism of what happens in London and the South East. So for years they've been getting uh, an advantage, uh, and that's a funding advantage, but also uh, a political um, policy advantage over the rest of um, the North, for instance. So on this one, um, I, I've been, they've appointed me as the, the champion for skills across the Northern Corridor. And I accept that because I used to work for the Learning and Skills Council. I was a, an apprentice bricky myself. Um, I've run a small company and I took apprentices on. Like Andy, one of the first things that I did when I became an MP was to take an apprentice on when it became... You're an apprentice like Andy. Andy. You're an absolute apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? So it, it, it's really important to us. And, and what the report identified is that in the north, we're roughly one grade behind where the South are. Well, something needs to happen. That can't be right, can it? That we're one grade behind. They're not more intelligent than us. They have better opportunity than us. They have better funding in their schools than us. They have all of the things that should be spread across the whole country. And all we're saying is we don't want special favours. We want a fair share of the funding. And that starts with a, a, a request for £300 million to level up the playing field so that our kids and some of your grandkids get the same chances as people in the South. I was just to them. I think we went to the same school, did we, did we not? We did, yeah. I don't think it's obvious, isn't it? <laughs>
is the kind of people we are. We don't have airs and graces. We've got feet on the ground. You know, we're, we're kind of not, we don't not expect anything in life necessarily. But because of that, maybe we do ourselves down. You know, our kids might have their, you know, their eyes down. They, might, they, they may not feel as internally as confident as others from other parts uh, of the country. You know, because of our industrial past, I think it's deep in the DNA of many Northwest people that they will grow up being employees, but not necessarily employers. And I think you've all got a job to do to work with us on that. I think we do need to change the culture in Northern communities, where we send the message to those kids growing up that they can be employees, they can be entrepreneurs. We bring businesses into schools. In fact, we might even base businesses uh, in schools to build that culture uh, in every community that young people growing up in, in the Northwest uh, can be successful business leaders. And I think you know, there's something we've all got to do to change the culture that is still there in our communities that means that we hold ourselves back more than we should. Uh, and I think you know, if, we, if we work on that, as well as giving technical education that boost, I think we'll be beginning to put some of this right. Questions from people that didn't go to school with Andy. <laughs> we go to school with you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Hi there, uh, Paul Taylor from Taylor Business Park and Culture. Um, just first of all, congratulations to both of you on, on your elected positions and the, and, and the fact that the cities managed to get their act together so well when you look across the other side of the Pennines and the devolution efforts and the issues that happen there are really struggling with. What do you think your biggest challenge is going to be going forward? Just, just on that, I mean, as you can see, we, we are great members, and, um, and I think sometimes people overplay the local rivalries. Liverpool and Manchester are bound up together. I mean, it's brilliant to have Sue here tonight, isn't it? The royal family. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is part of the royal, you know, the real royal family. Right? But it kind of epitomised what we're all like, mixed up Manchester and Liverpool, wasn't it? And that's what the programme said, wasn't it? You know, there was a kind of mixture, and that's what kind of most, most of our families are like. And, we have far more in common. Um, in fact, the arena attack, I mentioned it, I mean, so many people on Merseyside are there affected. So we're, we're, we're together, really. Of course, we'll be competitive, Steve and I, where we need to be, but we will work together. And I think it's really important for you all to understand we are moving further forward and faster than anywhere else in the country. And nowhere else is working like we're, like we're working. Um, Yorkshire can't agree on a devolution deal. The North East hasn't got one. Um, the West Midlands doesn't have the same partnership that we do. And actually, this is a, for that reason, this is a unique moment. While we've got this advantage, press it home. You know, so you work with us and let's all work together to press it home, get this Northwest economy moving and moving fast now. And that's what, that's what we need to do. To answer your question, what is the biggest challenge? Steve may see it differently. I mean, we could go back to skills. That is definitely, a, and that was a, a fair point. But I would probably say transport. I think our economy is growing beyond what our transport infrastructure can keep pace with. And I think we can all see it and feel it on the roads when we drive. You know, journeys that would have taken, what, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes, are now over an hour, aren't they, routinely? And it's not, it's a pretty stressful experience getting around the Northwest. And I think that's our problem. You know, it, it, like Steve was saying, on fair share of money for education. We have been treated as second class when it comes to transport investment for decades, uh, and it is really showing, and we desperately need uh, to do something about it. You know, London is light years ahead when it comes to transport, because they've been given you know, a huge investment over many years. And crucially, they were given the right to carry on regulating their transport system. We, we, we don't have that. The buses in Liverpool and Manchester have been a deregulated system for 30 years and they're chaotic. Well, we're getting the power to do something about that now, aren't we? Uh, but we, we need to kind of start running this as a transport system that integrates properly. We've got quangos like Highways England, they're not accountable to you. The businesses of the Northwest, they do their own thing. They need to be, you know, the M60s caused absolute chaos uh, for, for the people of Greater Manchester for a long time now. And yet, are they accountable enough to those long suffering uh, motorists. No, they're not. So we need to make them accountable uh, to you. So I just think transport is the big thing. And we're building later this year uh, to a big argument to the government around HS2 partly, but 
we want to see, we think it's a higher priority actually than HS2, west to east rail investment linking Liverpool, Manchester Airport, Manchester, Leeds and onwards. I would actually say, if you gave me the choice, that is the single highest transport investment priority for this country. And I promise you all, you and I will be joined at the hip, won't we, and kind of standing together, making that argument to the government, and I'm confident in the end we will, we will get what we need. As long as it starts at Liverpool first. <laughs> No, we won't be getting down to that. I'm yeah. going to build a wall on the East Lancaster to make you pay for it. You know? <laughs> Just before we go any further, there's no Mexicans in tonight, are there? <laughs> Just, just saying that, you, obviously, as you say, you're both good mates and John in the head. How often does the America, Greater Manchester and the Liverpool City region, obviously, you see each other, but how often do you actually get to appear at events like this and do Q&As? Um, we, we could do an awful lot, um, but yeah, obviously we've we got the Manchester. Yeah, we, we, we did uh, an event a few weeks ago, and that was the, um, the Liverpool leg, if you like, the fundraiser after the Manchester bomb, yeah. uh, and we you know, stood up and, and told our story, the, the one about, um, I get a phone call, I, I was with, it is a name drop, I was with the uh, US ambassador, yeah, he tried, said, he said trying to said. sell Liverpool, yeah. and, now, I, I, and uh, I was getting a phone call off my wife, and you know, she's obviously frantic trying to get hold of me, and eventually I got to phone her back, and she said, those are mortal words, which, you know, I, I, I don't want to, bring the whole thing down, but people will hear that, and I think Colin and Wendy will hear this, but my, my wife said to me, hey, don't worry, but, and your blood run cold, doesn't it, and you just go, oh, I went, but what, she said, the girls are in Manchester, and something's gone on, um, can you find out off Andy uh, what's happening, so I put the phone down, phone Andy, and I said, listen, the girls in Manchester, I've seen people with blood um, on them, there's a loud explosion, What's, what's gone on, and um, he said, I'll phone you back in a couple of minutes, and in the interim, he'd had a, a phone call, as I was phoning him from the Chief Constable, and then he phoned me back and said, hey, just get your girls out, and, and so we did that, you know, that was my bit, and then from that moment, Andy's life almost changed completely, because he was only two weeks into this, as the, the Metro Mayor of Greater Manchester, the, the whole of Greater Manchester, and uh, you're thrown into something like that, you know. There's no book that you can pick up and say, well, what do we do with you? Uh, and genuinely, uh, I think Manchester were really fortunate to have Andy Byrne with the experience that he had to be able to handle that situation. I think he did a great job on behalf of Greater Manchester, but the whole North West yeah. and the whole country. I think he's great. <laughs> Manchester at four in the morning, I'll be honest, I'm sick to the pit of my stomach, I think we all felt that, not knowing what to, to expect, you know, very, very kind of um, vivid feelings. But I was just saying, that the big debate, the first debate we had was whether or not to have a, a vigil, and um, Sir Richard Lees and I debated it, but then we kind of felt it probably was right uh, to, you know, we just felt instinctively people shouldn't have a chance to come together. Um, and that we're getting lots of abuse online, and oh, yeah, light a candle, that's going to help, and cuddle people. You, know, you get that kind of, you know, it's familiar to uh, people who, who know how kind of polarised opinion gets in these moments. But it was the best thing we ever did, not because of what we then said on the stage or anything like that, but it kind of gave the people a chance to express what they felt and come together. And I, you know, I, I remember being at that that night, and I'm sure you maybe remember watching it on television, and it was a, one of those truly kind of awe-inspiring moments of life, wasn't it, as people came together and they kind of almost demanded togetherness and, and the sense that we would stand together. Yeah, the reason I, I just wanted, I was very, very proud and I think, you know, Manchester stood for something. I think around the world people could see it stood for something. But there is a parallel with Colin and Wendy because all those years ago, you know, you did that when faced with that terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy beyond comprehension. I, I look back at you face that with, not with hate or anger, but with reaching out and reconciliation. And almost, you know, that, what you did then, was played out on a bigger scale by the people of, the people of Manchester.
teaches that there was a kind of sense of we're not going to let the terrorists win. The terrorists want to divide us. They want us to hate each other. That's what they want. So therefore we are not. And, and you know, Colin's nodding, but that is what you did as a people. Um, and we remember it very well. But that is what the city of Manchester then did as well. And said that and don't look back in anger and all, all of those things. And yeah, I say that tonight because I just think what's the common thread? It's the northwest of England. You know, the, the values of our people come out of moments like that. So it isn't necessarily about me or what any other civic leader did. It's just we gave a platform to the public to be themselves. And I'm sure Steve feels the same. It's what makes me think this is this place is the best place in the world with the best people in the world, the best values in the world. And it's you know it's like moments like that that you remind yourself, isn't it, just how lucky we are to live here. Yeah. Just to put that into context. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> A couple of blocks north from the trade towers on 9 11, and I saw everything that happened then, and obviously saw everything that happened in Manchester at the same time. And I know which one was more efficient. And I'm not going to spell it out for you, but it rhymes with Manchester. Hi, um, I work in education, and I'm a teacher, I was a teacher, and I'm now a businesswoman. Uh, we reach more than 12,000 children a week with primary languages across Manchester, Liverpool, Warrington, etc. I think my big question is about community cohesion, really, uh, and what your visions are for the future for community co cohesion. So we have 21 employees, some of whom are European nationals who work here, who have children here, who live here, and sometimes at this present moment feel anxious because they don't know what their future is going to be. Um, down the road at St Elphins, there's a large group of children who are Syrian who have come to this area, who need extra support to settle into this area. They are our future. I love children, and if you were to meet any of them, they're incredibly intelligent, creative, imaginative young beings, and they will make our North West great if you can find community cohesion somehow and a vision for every child's future. So that's my question, please. Well, I'm from a city where basically we're all immigrants. Yeah. Uh, Liverpool as a, as a port city, um, we're either Irish or something else. Um, um, for a long time, that has meant that we've taken the best of a lot of those attributes. Um, some of the bits that people might identify outside of our area that we have, I've been told that sometimes we can be a bit chippy. Um, but if anyone says that, you know, I'll have it. No, but yeah. Um, <laughs> But we, you know, we're very rightly proud of the uh, the way in which our diverse communities um, interact together as they do now. And I, I'm a, a firm believer that Brexit is the worst mistake this country will ever make. But we'll we'll see. Some people, you know, think it's going to be great for us, and we'll have ten years of of um, economic decline, and then all of a sudden we're going to get back to those great days of, of empire. Um, how we're going to do that as a little island, there you go, that's for us all to um, perhaps debate our future time. But, um, the one thing that I would say is that in areas, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, and it's no coincidence that I'm going to use this, because uh, Andy will see this on his way to Goodison Park, but there's an area uh, in my former constituency around Goodison Park, it's called County. And in county, what happened was those properties were bought up very, very cheaply um, by an organisation based in the south. And then they used that um, as a transit um, system for people who were asylum seekers or, or whatever, um, who came, started living in those communities, but very, very quickly were moved out. So your next door neighbour could be somebody different every three months. Now, you can't get social cohesion by doing that, and actually, um, that plays right into the hands of those people who would like to pander to the right-wing rhetoric that we hear, you know, about these people all coming over here, getting our best houses, well, they're not, um, and they're certainly not around that area. But the, the stable community that was there were fearful of this rapid change, and I don't think that's being xenophobic, I certainly don't think it's being racist. Um, they were genuinely concerned, and we needed to do something about that. But of course, central government were just interested in getting people away from the south. And we happened to be one of those areas. 
Um, it's happening in Holton at the moment. They've got um, a lot of people who are being resettled from the south into Holton at the moment. That will cause some difficulties for us. So I think what uh, when we were um, part of, of the, uh, the opposition, we were saying central government can help us. So those areas that do see rapid change, central government can provide us with the opportunity to um, have uh, more services so that people don't say, I can't see the doctor because all these people are coming in more. So the, the, the way ways that we can work together, um, I, I think if the government were genuine about trying to help um, areas in the north, they could have done that. They decided not. And what happened then, you see um, huge swathes of working class communities vote for Brexit. And I don't think there's any coincidence that that happened. These are the most volatile times and I think social media is, is fueling that volatility and that fragmentation. You know, <clears throat> gone are the days, aren't they, where we'd all of us in this room kind of watch the same four television channels and everyone would see life from all sides because you were hearing all different views on the same TV channels. Everyone's now living life with their own people, with their own views and their own little world on social media. And it's, it's quite worrying, I think. Society is fragmenting. so. Well, how we get the cohesion that you're talking about is a real challenge. We've got a commission running on that in uh, Greater Manchester after the bomb to ask those questions. Extremism is on the rise in all communities. People are feeling able to say things now that they wouldn't have said um, five or ten years ago. Um, and it's being fueled by politicians who've gone more to the extremes. It's a, it's a very worrying time, so you know, how to counter it is... I think you go back to, you start with families and communities, that's what we're going to do. We want to you know, empower people at the local level to tackle extremism, to challenge it, report it, tackle it, deal with it. I think it is about giving hope to all young people. I think that thing I was saying before about you know, some young people not having hope of a future after school, well, do something about that. You know, let's do something to make sure that all young people in the grow up feeling that they've got something to hope for uh, after school. But there's another practical thing we could do. Steve and I should support a centre like this. This is a ground, this is a space where people come to resolve differences, to talk. You know, this, this is, this, we need more of this in our society right now. We need to promote this. And I, that's why, again, I come back to it. It's why we're both on this stage tonight and supporting uh, the, the Peace Centre. You know, we, we believe in what they do, the importance of what they do. And I would say it's needed now more than it's ever been. Actually, Colin, you do peace talks between Liverpool and Manchester here. Do you do like sessions for uh, <laughs> Good ring? Hi, I'm Jennifer McGuinness from FDR Law and on the Committee for the Business Awards. Um, myself and the committee run this because we think Warrington's brilliant. We think the Warrington businesses are brilliant. We think we've got an awful lot to shout about. We see ourselves sometimes as the poorer relative of your great cities. And wondered how your great cities view us and how we are developing it, what can only be described as a rate of knots. I know you both cover various regions, I think you said six and ten. Where do we compare in comparison to these? <laughs> Give us a stat, Steve. <laughs> one really leading question. <laughs> you should be a politician. I, I happened to, um, to mention earlier that I was looking at some statistical um, economic evidence that said that Warrington is ahead of any of the six districts that I represent, or only the 10 that Andy represents, so well done to all of you. I'm not looking forward to the echo tomorrow, that's going to be a bear of room. It's a challenge for us, isn't it? Really? Um, I, I don't fear the, the, the fact that Warrington is doing so well. In fact, I want to encourage Warrington to do better because not everybody who works in Warrington is from Warrington, you know, not everybody who works in Liverpool is from Liverpool. Force those areas that are the travel to work areas. And there's this thing that the functional economic geography of which we include Warrington into our area. And we say, whilst we are 1.5 million people, that's who we're entitled to vote for a better on there. There's a lot more in Andy's Greater Manchester area. But in ours, there's about 3 million people because the functional economic geography includes 
the likes of one to for, for us we border onto Wales, so North Wales is part of ours and we're trying to do stuff there as well, we're with Welsh Assembly. And then if you go um, sort of to the Southport end, Lancashire uh, is part of that and they look to so we, just because there's a line on the map, it's a nonsense if we think that that um, area, everything that happens within the cartilage of that boundary, it doesn't. We all cross over and that's why I think the big thing about me and Andy being uh, friends uh, as well as politicians and, and uh, Metro mayors is that we're trying to pull all this together. And the reason is because of the scale of things. Li little Liverpool, just Liverpool, um, 460,000 people with its reputation and its international brand and all that can never really compete um, with some of the big behemoths of you know, so the London. Like Manchester and all that. Like, well, <laughs> well, what I'm going to say is, when, you, when you've got 1.5 million people with us and 2.4 with Manchester and you start to pull that together, then we start to hit, because 5 million is one, one of the, um, the, what they call super cities, so we need about 5 million people. Well, we can get closer. When you get Warrington involved, with us, we're just about touching the 5 million. And once you get 5 million people working together, then you can compete on an international scale against anybody at all. So that's why we want, if there's not going to be a Northern Powerhouse, this George Osborne abstract idea, we'll create a Northwest Powerhouse. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I can't let this moment go without asking the Warrington business mm -hmm. community. Does anybody here know Eileen Dilton? Can I ask you a favour? Could you put her in touch? Steve's got a thing about Eileen Dilton. <laughs> everything I go to be talked about. He reckons it's all, all of your success in Warrington is, you know, Eileen, yeah, I remember it, we all, we all remember the adverts, don't we, all that. He keeps saying, I need Eileen Bilton in Liverpool, one person to ring. Uh, is she, uh, this is what I like, um, But no, I think you, you kind of say you're in our shadow, I think Warrington, I think Warrington's positioned itself very well, actually, over the years, and sort of being the gateway to both, you know, I think you've, you've done that incredibly, uh, uh, skillfully, and, um, you know, Warrington, we both supported City of Culture a bit, didn't we? I know it didn't uh, succeed this time, but I think that's a, a reflection of Warrington's growing stature that it is making, uh, making that, that, that bid. And um, you know, as Steve says, that we, we, we want to build this with you. I, I, I would put the message out to you all uh, to, to, to challenge, um, you know, it's great to see the MP for Warrington South here. I think that's really important to, to see. <laughs> MPs working with the business uh, community. I, I would say to all of you, whatever the devolution deal is right for Warrington and Cheshire, I don't know what it, what, what it is, but get one. Because the more you come on board with us, and then if Lancashire comes on board, just think about that. You know, then we're getting powerful. You know, then together we can do things. So don't hold back. You know, get on and ask for a devolution deal. Uh, you know, we're talking to Terry and the councillor. You know, they're doing great things, actually, aren't they? We, we, we work well with them. If they're with us, though, with the same powers, then we can we can really do something. I'll just tell you one last little thought about um, Steve at Liverpool. That was, you know, um, you know, a few people in Manchester would, would agree with that. Of course. Um, I just I was was culture secretary a long time ago, running up the uh, London Olympics, and we were commissioning research at the time about how the country saw itself. You know, we were doing a lot of work about Britain and you know, how it saw it. It's kind of role in the world and saw it itself. And we commissioned a particular piece of uh, research on what people thought the second city um, of the country was. Uh, so we polled all over the country. Um, in London, 50% uh, of people said Birmingham, 50% said Manchester. In Birmingham, perhaps unsurprisingly, 80% of people said Birmingham, 20% uh, said Manchester. In Liverpool, it was more a third, a third, a third, a third said Liverpool, uh, a third said Manchester, a third said Birmingham. And they asked uh, people in, in Manchester, 80% uh, of people said London. It's a chance, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to these two, I tell you. And it's great to see cooperation between Manchester and Liverpool. <laughs> no, no, 
it's been an absolute pleasure. And one big advantage Warrington's got now, the Liverpool arena's open, equidistant. You can go to two different arenas on either end of the M62. Had to get the right motorway there. Andy, thank you very much, Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.